While seeing an aeroplane fly in the sky, little Johnny asked his father, Daddy, what is that? He says, that is an aeroplane. He said, Daddy, what is an aeroplane? What does it do? And Daddy explained, saying that people sit in an aeroplane and fly from one place to another. Johnny fell into a deep thought and Daddy asked him, what happened, Johnny? He said, but Daddy, how do the people climb to that great height? Do they have to bring such a big ladder? And Daddy laughed and said, no, Sonny, the plane comes down to the people. They don't have to climb to that height. We could not reach the perfection that God demanded of us. So God came down to us and that is precisely what Christmas is all about. Christmas is of the mighty God becoming a little baby in order to save us from our sins. Pause a while and ask yourself, how many of the four Gospels carry the Christmas story of Jesus? The story of his conception, his birth and his childhood days. Yes, there are only two Gospels which speak about the conception, birth and the boyhood of Jesus. And they are the Gospels according to St. Matthew and the Gospel according to St. Luke. The first two chapters of Matthew's Gospel and the first two chapters of Luke's Gospel were added lastly to the entire collection of the life story of Jesus. Matthew wrote it as a sort of a trailer, just as a movie has a trailer which announces the main sequences. The trailer has to be very catchy, otherwise people will not come for the movie. So Matthew had the gospel, the main themes that he would later develop, put it, he put all those in a nutshell and he put it at the start. The same with Luke. It's like an overture. Before a musical composition is uh, developed or is sounded, the musician plays the overture. That is, he plays certain key themes that he will later develop in his entire musical composition. So the infancy narratives, the first two chapters of the, according to the, uh, the first two chapters of Matthew's gospel and the first two chapters of Luke's gospel together make up the infancy narrative. In this module, we are going to reflect on the story of Jesus' birth and his childhood as recorded in the gospels according to St. Matthew and St. Luke. The first chapter of Matthew's Gospel and the first chapter of Luke's Gospel mentions the story of Jesus' birth, how his birth came about. The second chapter of both these Gospels mentions the response of the people to this good news of Jesus' birth. A man entered the library in a huff and scolded the librarian, saying, What kind of a book did you give me? Oh, ye kaun sa book tumhe diya? Isme sirf uh, character hi character hai, koi story wo hai nahi. There are only characters in this, no story at all. The librarian said, Oh, so you are the guy who took the telephone directory home. If we open the gospel according to St. Matthew to the first chapter, we will find only a list of characters, a repetitive, monotonous, list of uh, seemingly unconnected names. Maybe they do not have a meaning as of now to us. But there is a reason why Saint Matthew did it, began his gospel in this particular boring way. Because he was writing for Jews, for those Jews who had become Christians. And he knew that for a Jew, a genealogy meant it, it, the person's ancestry had to be traced. Genealogy means a line of descent traced from an ancestor. Even in the Bible, when an important person is introduced, like for example, when Noah is introduced, his story is begun with a genealogy, a list of ancestors. We can check it out in Genesis chapter 5. Even when Abraham is introduced, his story is begun again with a genealogy in chap Genesis chapter 11. Uh, in this unit, we shall be reflecting on Matthew chapter 1 verses 1 to 17. 
If we look at verse 17, it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation of Babylon, it is 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, it is 14 generations. The, list, the story begins with Abraham. Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. It was this one man with whom God formed a covenant and circumcision was a sign of that covenant. Abraham was the, uh, considered to be the father of the nation just as in India we consider Mahatma Gandhi to be the father of the nation. Then we have the next important milestone or key event that is the reign of King David. It was looked upon as a golden era. Even today, the Jews look back to the time of King David, the rule of King David. Because before him, the, the nation of Israel, all the 12 tribes were always at war with each other. It was only King David who succeeded in uniting them. Then the next important event in their history, in the salvation history of Israel, was the deportation to Babylon, the Babylonian exile. Though this was a down peak, so to say, it was an event that the Jews would rather forget or put it behind them. Nevertheless, it was important because it was only after this that the two tribes of Israel returned. The rest were lost in the Assyrian exile and the remnant came back after the Babylonian exile. From the Babylonian exile, Matthew takes up the line to Jesus Christ as the next milestone. Matthew is trying to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of the history of Israel. The coming of Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Christ the Christos in Greek which means the anointed one of God. Matthew is trying to tell the Jews, those Jewish Christians who had been excommunicated because of their faith, because of believing in Jesus. Matthew is trying to reassure them that by believing in Jesus, you have received the fulfillment of the promises made to the nation of Israel. The entire history of the nation of Israel has been under the watchful guidance of God. It has been in God's perfect plan of salvation and the climax of this history of Israel is the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Another important characteristic, what is so different about this genealogy that Matthew begins his gospel with? The first reason he does it is to show that Jesus' ancestry can be traced right up to Abraham. He wants to show his people that Jesus is a pure-blooded Jew, a pakka Jew, so to say. And you find this verse, uh, this word number 14 mentioned three times, as we just read. 14 generations. Why 14? It was an artificial arrangement of 14, three, uh, 14 generations into 3. That is a total of 42 generations. An artificial arrangement, it was a mnemonic, that is a memory device in those days when writing material was not available. So the people had to memorize those lists of names and many of the things. So it was by word of mouth that things were mostly transmitted. And to make it easy to remember, this uh, list was contrived. Most of it is history, but a few names have been duplicated or have been added. But the main purpose, the reason this number 14, in Hebrew, every letter had a numeric value. Now, if you see the word David, the name David, in Hebrew, they do not have the vowels. They drop the vowels and only hold on the consonants. Like if we spell D-A-V-I-D -D in English, in Hebrew, you will write only D, V and D. The number D has a numeric value of 4 and the, num uh, the letter V has a numeric value of 6. So we add 4 plus 6 plus 4. That is D plus V plus D and it sums up to 14. So Matthew is trying to show again by this number, the set of 14 generations that Jesus is the fulfillment. Jesus is the expected son of David, the one whom the entire nation of Israel has been expecting and ardently longing for. What else is special about Matthew's genealogy? 
In Matthew's genealogy, you will find the list of five women. Oh, women are mentioned. So what's so special? Yes, Jewish genealogies never mention the name of women because it was a patriarchal society. And in, among them, they believed that a woman was a second class citizen with no rights of her own. A woman was considered to be a Jew only because she was married to a man who was circumcised. She was married to a man who was a Jew and who was circumcised and that's why she belonged to the people of God. It was Jesus who changed all this. He said that there is no difference baptism for male as well as female. We can recall what Paul, St. Paul said in the letter to the Galatians chapter 3 verse 28. So now there is no difference between male and female, between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free men. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So Matthew is bringing down the barrier that was erected between male and female. He is in a way showing that Jesus Christ made male and female one. He brought down the dividing barrier through Jesus. And that's why these five women, the names of these five women are mentioned. Also, the reason their names are mentioned is because they played an initiative, they showed initiative and hence their names are included in the family tree of Jesus. But if we see their stories, in fact, some of the stories are very scandalous. It can cause a great scandal. Then why were such names included? That brings us to the next point that Jesus has come not only for saints, but sinners as well, as he said. In Matthew chapter 9 verse 5, he says, uh, in Matthew's gospel, he said, I have come for, not for the righteous, but I have come for sinners. If we see the story of the first woman who is mentioned in this family tree, it's Tamar. If you study her story in Genesis chapter 38, you will find that she was a seductress who seduced her own father-in-law. For whatever reason, uh, she was married to Judah's first son who dies. Then by the Levirate law mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 25 verses 5 to 10, she is supposed to marry the second son and that's what happens but the second son also dies. So by right she had to marry the third son as well. But this boy was, he was young and not of marriageable age. So Judah puts off this alliance saying that I will give him to you later on when he grows up. But he goes back on his word. So Tamar gets herself impregnated by Judah. That was the only way that she could do it and continue the family line of her husband but yet her name is included because this is precisely the meaning of Jesus's coming he has come for saints as well as sinners sometimes we think we need to help God accomplish his plan but the beauty of this genealogy is that it shows us that God's plan cannot be thwarted it could be delayed, but God's plan can never be put off. It will finally reach its accomplishment. The next woman we have here mentioned is Raha, who was also a prostitute. But she showed initiative when she helped the spies sent by Joshua in the land before the conquest of the city of Jericho. And she helps them and saves their lives. The next woman mentioned is Ruth. Now Ruth was a Gentile, a Moabite woman. Now there was a law in Deuteronomy chapter 23 verse 3 which says, that no Ammonite or Moabite can be included in the Lord's assembly even up to the 10th generation. This rule of is now again being broken. This barrier is being broken and that is what Matthew emphasizes. The next point as I said what St. Paul said in Galatians 3.28 There is no difference between Jew and Gentile for both are one in Christ Jesus. So we have Rahab mentioned, we have Ruth mentioned. We also have uh, Bathsheba, though she is not mentioned by name. She is mentioned as the wife of Uriah. She, Uriah was a Hittite. So we have these Gentiles mentioned in the family tree of Jesus, showing that Jesus has come to break the barrier between Jew and Gentile, between slave and free man, between man and woman, and also between saint and sinner. We have the last woman mentioned who is Mary. Mary was immaculately conceived and it was by virtue of the, in, the merits of Jesus' death on the, the salvific merits of Jesus' death and resurrection that was applied to her in anticipation. So she, uh, all these women played a role in the history of salvation, in salvation history, but Mary played a key role. 
We have a particular formula being repeated in this genealogy. We see Abraham was the father of Isaac and Isaac the father of Jacob. So and so. It goes on from X was the father of Y, Y was the father of Z. It goes on right down the verses where there is a sudden change. Now if we have got attuned to this or if we have tuned out reading this list of names, we could very easily miss out this important fact. Somewhere down the line, the formula changes. In verse 16, we read, Jacob, the father of Joseph. He should have, it should have been mentioned as Joseph, the father of Jesus. But here comes the change. Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So we see the change. If we have taken up this reading, or if we hear someone reading it, and we say, oh, I've heard this before. It's such a boring list of names. And we tune out or we go to sleep. We could very easily miss out this nugget that is there, which shows the virginal conception of Jesus. How he was conceived, not by the will of man, not by the will of flesh, but by the Holy Spirit. So we see, as we come to the conclusion of this unit, we remember the main points. That Jesus has come for Jew and Gentile. He brings down the barrier that was erected between Jew and Gentile. The barrier which was erected between male and female. The barrier between saint and sinner. Between free man and a slave. So Jesus has come to unite us all under his banner. He, is brought, he brings us all together in himself to the Father. There is one last point. There are seven generations. There are each set of seven into six generation. If you factorize 42, it comes out to be seven into six is equal to seven, six are 42. But there is a seventh generation, a seventh set of generation which Jesus inaugurates. Now seven stood in Israel for perfection. The number seven stood for perfection. So Jesus inaugurates the perfect generation. Let us bring all our ancestors before Jesus. If some inherit, if we inherit something, some sicknesses or diseases through the genealogy, through the family tree, this can be cut off. We can link our bloodlines to the royal bloodlines of Jesus. And as Jesus came from that sinful past and he redeemed the entire humanity, so he will redeem us from our sinfulness and he will set us free from anything untoward that we have inherited through his coming. And this is precisely the message, the good news of Christmas. Hence the infancy narratives are a gospel, are the gospel in a nutshell. Thank you.